Besides, I have skills I want to test out too. Devour all. Reverse grip technique. Gluttony. He just dissolved all those scales instantly. Leave Charybdis to me. At this point, you guys are just getting in the way of my attacks. But we can still help you. Just kick back for a little bit. And besides... It's already completely regenerated. If it uses another wide-scale attack like that, I'm not confident I can protect all of you. So just go back and listen to Benny Mara's orders, okay? Sound good? <laughs> now, time to see if you pray today. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to Volume 3. For that time, Satoru Goja got reincarnated as a slime. If you guys have no idea what's going on and just got here, make sure you go check out the previous two volumes, with this being the third entry in the series. If you guys want to figure out the story of what happened to Satoru Gojo after his death to Ryum and Tsukuna. Anyway, continuing on from where we left off last time, let's get back right into the story. Upon the end of the Great War with the Orcs, a meeting is called between the races of the Forest of Jura. Rimuru's faction with the goblins, hobgoblins, and Kijin included, the lizardmen, the orcs who had survived, and the dryad trainee. Wishing to have the matter settled immediately, the chairman of the meeting, who would be Rimuru, who had contributed the most to the battle, or, well, Gojo in this timeline, would state that he's not interested in blaming any of the remaining survivors for their actions. Reiterating what I talked about last time, with his choice to leave the 150,000 survivors to help rebuild the destruction within the marshes that they had caused on their march. Gojo would then reiterate that if anyone wishes to see them punished, then they must take it up with him. Basically, Gojo says that if you think you're stronger than me, I'll take what you're saying as law. No one stepped up to that after seeing him use two fingers to poke a hole through space and through in a giant orc disaster. Anyway, to prevent a repeat of the events that led to the entire invasion to begin with, Ramiro would intend to have the other three factions within the forest offer to do trade and food specifically with the orcs. The lizardmen could provide fish and water, the dryad fruit and vegetables, and Gojo will house them, basically keeping the labor force as close as possible. However, in exchange, the orcs will be dispersed through the forest and be working to rebuild and modernize the settlements within the forest. It's it's crop sharing. He he basically just used crop sharing to to keep the orcs around so they didn't have to die. The official alliance would have been recognized by Trainee, with the Dryad Trainee declaring Rimuru Gojo as the new Chancellor of the Great Forest of Jura. To which everyone except Gojo would unanimously agree sounds great. Bet you that little strength comment came back to bite you, huh, buddy? He was not excited, considering the big shots of the world to all be scum. He has now joined them as a chancellor. <sighs> anyway, Gojo basically can't refuse at this point with him being placed as the figurehead of the Great Forest Alliance. After the meeting ended, this would be when a confrontation between Benny Maru, the general of Rimuru's forces, and the Sun and the new Orc King after the passing of the Orc disaster would have a discussion. He's fully aware of the horror and crimes that the orcs as a race had committed to the ogre village, and he felt that his lack of punishment was unacceptable, asking Benny Maru to attain revenge for his people by taking his head. Benny Maru would just sigh to the representative of the orcs, saying that if he had listened to a word his master had said back there, Gojo's decision had been to spare them, and Benny Maru had no interest in fighting him, telling the orc that if he really wanted, to attain some atonement for what their race had done, then he should continue to work hard for his master. It's after this point that brings us back to where we ended off the last episode, with the arrangement between Dwargon and the newly unnamed nation at the time of this episode starting, would form an alliance with Gazel Dwargo himself coming with his Pegasus Knights and forming a meeting with Rimuru, the leader of this unnamed nation. Gojo himself, and the meanwhile it would be delivered Vesta in a few days upon the treaty, with this drunk being the same guy who back in his first journey to the city of dwarves 
had dumped a bunch of booze on him. Not like he was complaining, considering he was too busy enjoying his seating position, and, well, it's not like he could really get dirty anyway as a slime. Gojo would ask if this drunkard would actually be useful in any way, to which Kaijin and Gaza would both stand up and vouch for Vesta, saying that he is quite the ingenious mind when he's got something to put his mind towards. Anyway, Vesta would have been completely destroyed after he had been kicked out of his position and was looking for a fresh start. This would begin the new cultivation plans for more healing and hapokte herbs within Veldora's cave to create more full potions and potentially water them down into low potions, according to Vesta's advice, so as to not lower the value of potions on the entire market. For the sake of the story, we're going to be calling the nation Tempest just to make things clear for people so you know where I'm talking about, but I'm pretty sure that Gojo actually wouldn't name the city this. Some ideas that I think it could be named would either be after his best friend, like Suguru, for the city, and then a different name for the country. So the main capital of Tempest as a nation, or the, maybe he could just call it the nation of Jura, as in the Jura Forest. But I'm pretty sure he would name the city something like Suguru, or something related to that. I'm not sure, but for the relevance of the story, we're just going to continue to call it Tempest. You can all come up with some cool ideas in the comment section on what Gojo would name the city if he was to be the monster king in this universe. Honestly, I think if I were to come up with an original name that I think would be cool, maybe the nation of Aether, as in Aether, like, the connection between the sky and earth, since Gojo's whole moniker is that throughout the heavens and earths he's the strongest, so having his own city to protect now kind of grounds him. I don't know if that's too punny, but... Anyway, if you guys have a better idea, let me know down in the comment section. Moving on, after Milam and Rimuru and Gojo would become friends, this would be when the Beast Master would have sent one of his own minions, that being one of the three Beast Beastketeers, Phobio. Phobio would have come in with the same condescending attitude that he would have in the original, saying he was there to subjugate the monsters under the name of Eurozania and the Beast Master Carrion. It's upon Phobio's rather rude and loud introduction, that he would be the one to disrespect the demon lord Milam who had taken a liking to the city. With Gojo being preoccupied being basically the president of this monster village, Milam would have dug Phobio's face into his newly paved stone streets going right down the middle of town. Upon Phobio's resurrection from Gojo using his full potions, he would continue to act like a bratty little kid saying that he's, he'll come back with the full force of the Beastmaster carrying at his disposal. Milam would ask Rimuru if she could just kill him now. Gojo would think about it for a moment before deciding to let him go. When his aides would ask him why he was doing this, Gojo would say he was curious to see how powerful the average demon lord was, thinking he could get a good gauge on strength after fighting Milam and now wanting to see what this carrion was like. In reality though, this wouldn't have been advice from Great Sage or anything like that. It was just Gojo looking to get himself into another fight. That night, Phobio and his men who had been now camping in the forest would be approached by a couple of masked Majin. These Majin footmen in tier introducing themselves as being a part of the moderate Harlequin alliance. It's at this point when they're talking about how annoyed and how much he claims he wants power that Phobia would be again seduced by them, just like he had in the original timeline. With this having hooked their bait, the Majin would guide Phobia to the seal of Charybdis, Charybdis being a spiritual life form that was created through the magic kills of Veldora, the true storm dragon. This essentially making Charybdis a sibling of Gojo in this universe, which we discover later through Rimuru, and in the original timeline, Rimuru believes the reason he was even attacking the city was because of Veldora inside of himself. Anyway, enough of that. Thompio would be absorbed into Charybdis, with Charybdis taking over his flesh and gaining a physical body, turning into a giant shark-like dragon. This would begin to fly through the sky, being discovered in just a few mere days, creating chaos in Tempest. At the same time, this is when the Pegasus Knights I had mentioned at the end of last episode would have been sent to Tempest with Gazel Dwargon being particularly interested in Rimuru's activities. Gojo would be already excited for this fight, with Gojo saying that he'll take out the dragon himself, telling them that there's no need for their assistance. The rest of his forces would disagree, 
with Ranga, Shion, and Benimaru and the rest of his forces basically begging for a chance to shine. Gojo would sigh, with him realizing that if he gave in here and went himself, there would be no way he could tell Milam not to, as she had already been declined by him when she asked if she could just go take it out. Gojo at that time had just wanted to fight Krubdis himself, but now he really didn't have a good reason. Having told Milam that someone as great as a demon lord shouldn't be attacking some meager pest that was after his town, saying this was their issue. Essentially, his subordinates would use the same logic he had used on Milam on himself. The result of the ongoing battle would show Charybdis' intense regeneration and power, with his scales ripping through both his own forces and the Pegasus Knights who were now defending against Charybdis. It's at this point that we see the scene from the opening, with Gojo himself appearing and using his new skill he had gained when he had combined Predator and Starving from the Orc disaster when he had absorbed it. This being his new skill, Gluttony. Gojo was particularly excited about this new skill, specifically because Gluttony has the ability to nullify and devour attacks, while also absorbing them into himself. This means he can now use the abilities of his new slime body without transforming, giving him valuable time in battle. Gojo's also been thinking about how Gluttony can apply using cursed energy and other techniques like a simple domain, but he hasn't gotten that far yet. Just experimenting with the skill for now. Gojo versus Charybdis would be an intense battle, with him using cursed energy and trying a hollow purple on it, and it doing essentially nothing, with the magical density of Charybdis basically eating through the hollow purple. It's at this point that Gojo is once again being presented with the difference between cursed energy and magical energy rates, basically just being the fact that magicules can overpower cursed energy in its entirety. Just like how Milam was able to just shatter through his infinity with just a basic attack spell with just how much magic kill she possesses being the same case here. His hollow purple simply just didn't have enough power to shatter through Cryptus's defense. But anyway, it's at this point that another half a day would pass, with the Pegasus Knights becoming exhausted and the rest of Tempest's forces basically becoming the same. This is when we would see Phobio's inner voice starting to leak out, where he's screaming, Milim! Gojo would get annoyed asking if Milim is asleep while standing over her poking her with a stick under the tree. Milam would quickly stand up saying she was meditating, deciding after Rimuru explains that it turns out this guy was after her, that she would take care of it. Gojo would sigh, watching, wondering what she's going to do. When Milam gets up into the sky, no one would believe the sight before their eyes. A massive attack of magicules would obliterate Charybdis, with Gojo having asked her to try and spare Phobio to not anger the other demon lord, this would have caused a burnt Phobio to be tossed to the ground, with Gojo catching him using his infinity to teleport there and catch Phobio for setting him down, splashing another healing potion on him. Milam would laugh with him saying, I guess that was restraint, huh? Gojo thinking he's got a long way to go now, that is until he can reach that level of power. Once Phobio was awake, he would beg for everyone's forgiveness, basically bowing and falling on the ground. Finally, he's starting to act like an actual representative of a country. That is, until he would explain how he became Charybdis, based off of the two clowns he had met named Tyr and Footman. Gabiru, Traini, and Benny Maru would all confirm that they've had their own run-ins with the Hamadret Harlequin Alliance, with them all talking about the cases so far, specifically with how Gelmud had worked with them during the Orc Lord incident. Based on this information, Rumor would conclude that this group is a mysterious jack-of-all-trades group that sows chaos, Gojo thinking it must be some sort of mercenary group that has some strange or unknown goal that must be affected by their town's existence. Milam would openly suspect Clayman, saying that he loves scheming and it's probably his fault to begin with. But regardless, Phobia would still blame himself, although it was his fault, and would offer his life to Rimuru, basically throwing him to his mercy. Both Gojo and Milam would have no real interest in killing him, however, this would be when Demon Lord Carrion would show up, the golden-haired man standing over seven feet tall. Apparently, Phobio's subordinates who he had left in the forest last night before he had turned to Charybdis would have reported to Carrion Phobio's actions and how he's been angering this town. Basically, he would be pretty pissed off. As soon as he arrives on the scene, he would apologize to Rimuru and then slam Phobio into the ground. Gojo would laugh, saying that if he's really here for some vengeance, well, he wouldn't mind going a round or two with him. Karyon would look at Gojo before saying he passes with a smile. 
With this being the end of the incident, to Gojo's disappointment, he would accept the Demon Lord's apology. Gojo would laugh, then saying that if he has something else he could offer him, he would be interested in a trade or non-aggression pack with Karian for Yurizania. Tempest and Yurizania would then create their trade and non-aggression pact, with the two shaking hands basically sealing the deal. Fuebo would be dragged off through a teleportation spell, now once again heavily wounded with blood squirting out of his forehead. With the threat finally being over, Gojo would sign saying they can finally take it easy for a little bit. The next day, following Cryptus' defeat, the Jura Tempest Federation would hold a festival to celebrate, mostly by chopping up and grilling all of the Megalodon meat that they had attained from the summons of Charybdis. Meanwhile, Kaijin and Kurobe would be harvesting the scales from the giant monster that had been left behind and are now trying to create armor and weapons out of Charybdis' scales. In this timeline, this is where Melon would bring up the idea to Rimuru of deciding he should become a demon lord. Gojo would laugh, saying he actually wouldn't be against being called a demon lord, wondering if there's anything special about being one to begin with, though. Gojo would reply to Milam, saying, You know, I actually don't have anything against becoming a demon lord. It sounds cool, but also really annoying. I just don't want a bunch of self-proclaimed heroes coming to try and slay me all the time. Not quite my idea of a fun time. Gojo would then take another sip of his sweet sake. It's at this point that Milan would actually remember something, saying that she has something to do before she would rudely get up and leave, exploding out of the door and pushing it down, causing Gojo to sigh again at her lack of common sense. However, when Gojo retires for the night, falling into a deep slumber, he would have an interesting dream. He would have a dream of the five children that Shizu's memories had left behind when he had absorbed her those being the children she had been teaching at a school in the Kingdom of Ingracia. With this dream being the sign, Gojo would take it as a sign from Shizu that he could finally take some time to rest and take care of her regrets. With him having gathered a plethora of subordinates who've all gathered strength and power together, having even taken on Charybdis and even held their own for over a day and a half before Milam took it out, Rimuru could safely leave Tempest in their hands. Gojo would announce his interest in traveling to the people of Tempest, with him saying that he will return and is just going to complete some regrets of an old friend, with Gojo only allowing Ranga to accompany him on their journey. Rimu would be riding Ranga, with his speed being the optimal way to travel here, considering that Gojo has never been to Angracia before, meaning he can't use the teleportation technique that he has access to using Infinity into locations he either knows where they are or where he's been before like how he was able to transport to Jujutsu High in a matter of seconds after taking out Jogo with Itadori Yuji in tow in his last life. This would be the first time that Rimuru would have left the forest of Jura without an accompanying party, with just him and Ranga traveling. This is Rimuru's first step, and Gojo's first step, in meeting with the head of the Freedom Association, the Grand Master of the Free Guild, better known as the Adventurer's Guild a giant international organization that works across the world of Tensera to protect humanity from monsters. The name of the Grand Master being Yuki Kagurazaka, a student that Shizu had worked alongside and trained and raised herself after she had retired as an adventurer. At least, thankfully, Rimuru had a connection with Fuse, Gojo having met Fuse and the other adventurers who had intervened in Tempest earlier. Rimuru would easily get an introductory letter from him, which allows him to even make it into Yuki's office without having to do much footwork. Personally, Gojo would be more interested in the capital of Ingracia's technology and their wealth, with them possessing thin panes of glass, higher levels of architecture, and just creativity that already surpassed the other places in this world he has seen so far even rivaling that of Dwargon. Of course, he had only spent a few days in that city anyway, but I digress. Anyway, when Yuki would arrive walking to his office saying that he had been prepared to meet with him, his face would change seeing Shizu's mask on this stranger's face. Yuki would kick off the ground, throwing his right leg up into the air and kicking it at Gojo's head. Gojo would simply stand there as his foot stops moving. Yuki's eyes would narrow, wondering what the hell this technique is. At this point, Rimuru, Gojo would then put Yuki's leg back on the ground, putting his hand up on the side and pushing it away. Yuki would then ask why does he look like his master Shizu, with Rimuru removing the mask from his face. Gojo would smile saying it's because that he killed and ate Shizu, taking her form. Yuki would be promptly overcome with anger as he attacks Rimuru again, trying to use magicules and half shatter this barrier. But again, he would be blocked. 
Rimuru would then catch him off guard by saying a reference he himself had used with Shizu, being a manga reference of I'm not a bad slime, referencing to a video game from his time. It's at this point Yuki would realize that Rimuru is another otherworlder, coming from the same world of Japan that he himself and Shizu had come from. Yuki and Gojo would get along even better than the original Rimuru had in canon, with both of them being these nonsensical and whimsical types, who can get deadly serious. After this, similar events would occur with Gojo giving Yuki copies of the manga he was wondering about from their original world, with Yuki not even being able to finish reading some of these before their chat would end. He would ask Gojo if he's looking for a way back to their world. Suddenly flashes of the cursed spirits, the attacks on Japan, and his two students, Yuji and Yuta fighting Sukuna would flash in his mind. Gojo would narrow his eyes saying that by the time he would make it back there, there'd be no point saying that for now he's just there to deal with Shizu's regrets. Yuki would go on saying that he believes it's definitely possible to return to their world, talking about the legends of monsters and dragons from their world, saying that there must be a way that monsters from this world had snuck through the barrier between dimensions. But Yuki would stop, with Gojo's eyes being serious about cutting off this topic. Yuki would smile looking at Gojo's eyes saying he's never seen eyes as beautiful as his before. Gojo would smirk saying that he'll take it as a compliment, Yuki would chuckle at this comment, saying that he'll arrange for Gojo to take Shizu's old job as an instructor at the academy, where she had been teaching the other world or children of class S. Gojo would smile, saying it's guess he puts his teacher face back on, with Gojo returning to the classroom as a sensei. If you guys want to see volume 4 for that time Sothro Gojo got reincarnated as a slime, make sure to get this video to 200 likes. Once you guys hit that like goal, I'll immediately start work on the next volume. If you guys enjoy this, you know what to do, and I'll see you then. Ciao.